السلام علیکم ویلکم بیک ٹو ای این جی فائیو او تھری دس از یور لیکچر تھرٹین اینڈ ایف یو ریمبر دی پریویس لیکچرز دیٹ وی ہیو بین ڈسکسنگ ود یو آل یو ول نو دیٹ ان دا لاسٹ لیکچر وی سوئچڈ اوور فرام دا ٹریول لاگ ٹو دا شارٹ اسٹوری یو ہیڈ اے نمبر آف لیکچرز ہاؤ مینی واز اٹ یو ریمبر Eleven lectures you had on um, Jonathan Swift's travel or Gulliver's travels, and the last lecture that I delivered, I gave you the background to the short story, and I tried to explain to you how this genre or this form of literature it evolved very suddenly, um, very completely, in the middle of the 19th century. And um, if you go back to the previous lecture, uh, some of the things that I told you were, one, that this genre or this form of literature um, did not take such a long time to develop or to evolve as the other genres like drama had done, like novel had done. Um, so you do not have a very long history for the short story, although um, the short story has always formed a part of the novel, the drama, and any kind of narrative. I also told you in the previous lecture the different forms of short story and the fact that um, although the short story um, originated in England, with the work of Sir Walter Scott. It was not in England, not in the 19th century, that the short story um, had its maximum impact. You had Sir Walter Scott writing, and then there is a, a gap in time um, during which not much work was being done on the short story in England. But this is not the situation um, in the rest of Europe or what is called the continent and in America because the influence of the short story was not just in Europe. It also went on to America where a lot of work was produced. A lot of good sto short stories um, were created. Uh, in England, it is only um, with um, Robert Louis Stevenson in the 1880s that you find the short story coming its, into its own as a genre. So uh, between Sir Walter Scott and Robert Louis Stevenson there is the gap of uh, about 60 years during which not much work was being done in England. However, on the continent, that is in Europe, particularly in France, um, there was a lot of work being done. Flaubert and uh, Maupassant uh, were writing short stories. In the same way, in Russia, Turgenev and even more than Turgenev, Anton Chekhov started writing short stories. And his short stories are so powerful that to this day, um, Chekhovian short story forms a part of um, most of the short stories that are written. In the last lecture, I also explained to you um, the various forms of the short story, that is the various categories of short story. And I told you that there you have the biographical, you have the event plot, which was um, the earliest form of the short story. You have the Chekhovian. You have the cryptic short story um, and you have other forms of short stories but the, the, the two forms that are most dominant even in the 21st century are one the event plot short story, the other is the Chekhovian um, short story. So um, the influence of Anton Chekhov uh, is is brought into the 21st century uh, and you find that writers are still trying, trying to imitate his style. 
Um, that is uh, how lasting uh, and how strong the influence of um, the Russian uh, short story writer was. Um, the writer um, whom we are going to be doing in the next few lessons is Edgar Allan Poe. And um, again, I would refer to the last lecture in which I told you a little about Edgar Allan Poe, the short stories that he wrote, and the fact that they became very popular. Another thing that you need to know about Edgar Allan Poe is that um, he writes the kind of story that makes your imagination work. He could be writing a horror story. He could also be writing a mystery story. Uh, but whatever story he does write, there's always something um, that you find, let's say, missing in the short story. Not missing in the sense that the short story is incomplete, but missing in the sense that there's something that you have to reach out for. Something uh, for which you have to read again and again. Uh, the, the meaning of um, a short story written by Poe is not very easy to, to get. And this story, which is titled Eleonora, is one such story. Uh, if you remember uh, from what I told you about the um, different forms of short story, I emphasized the fact that um, the short stories do not have, do not follow a logical sequence or a linear pattern. It's not uh, something that starts from birth and ends at death. A short story takes up an incident, a happening, a feeling, an emotion, a character from the middle of the, um, the happening and then goes backwards and forwards discussing what happened. So it can talk about an incident, it could also talk about a place and you, would, you will not be able to find a chronological sequence of events. You don't have things starting with the beginning or starting at point A, going on to the middle or point B and then concluding at point C. You might have things starting at point B, that is the middle. And from there you go to point A or point C. So uh, the, the short story does not have a linear progression. And that is what you're going to find in Eleonora. Eleonora is um, a short story, you could say, with a difference. And um, the difference you'll see in a while. Uh, I'm going to read through the text like I usually do. And I'm also going to be offering you some explanation. And I wish you had um, some way that you could share your ideas with me. But let us make the best of this opportunity. So this uh, story is titled Eleonora and it's written by Edgar Allan Poe. I am come of a race noted for vigor of fancy and ardor of passion. So two things Poe gives you at the very outset. Fancy or imagination, passion, emotions, sentiments that are very strong. So he says, I belong to a family, a race, which uses its imagination and which is very emotional, very full of sentiments. So two things he clarifies at the very beginning, that he belongs to a family which um, is very emotional, um, which gives a lot of value to sentiment and uh, where men use their imagination. So these two things I want you to remember because these are the two things that we're going to look for as we read through the story. Men have called me mad. It's very frequent that people who are um, emotional are called mad. You get angry at someone and people say, oh, he's mad at me. 
um, you imagine things and um, you imagine the beauty of a place and people say, live in this world, come back to earth. You are mad to think that you can go and live in such a, um, a utopian world, in, in the world of imagination. So he says, men have called me mad, but the question is not yet settled. There are still people who um, are in favor of uh, me being sane. Uh, but the question that arises is whether madness is not the loftiest intelligence. Now, um, it has always been thought that there's a very fine line between genius and insanity. And there are times when it is very difficult to um, determine where one ends and the other begins. That is, um, sanity ends and insanity begins, or genius ends and insanity begins. So, um, whether all that is profound does not spring from disease of thought, from moods of mind exalted, at the expense of the general intellect. So there is a discussion going on, there's a debate going on uh, as to what exactly is madness and what is genius. And there are people who think that geniuses are mad. You must have um, heard and seen countless stories of uh, the concept of the mad scientist. Now, when you have somebody like the mad scientist, you have a man who, uh, who's a genius basically, but whose genius crosses the boundary of sanity. And he starts to make something that would be destructive for the human race, or he starts to make something like uh, a time tunnel or something really um, fanciful. So um, uh, Poe says that um, as the narrator of um, the story, uh, he says that I belong to a race that is emotional, that, uh, that, that uh, has a lot of imagination. And he also says, they who dream by day are cognizant of many things which escape those who dream only by night. You know, those who have um, dreams during the day are thought to be escapists. But according to this narrator, those who uh, dream in the daytime are aware of many things that are hidden from those who dream at night or those who uh, wake during the day. In their grave visions, they obtain glimpses of eternity and thrill in awakening to find that they have been upon the verge of the great secret. So, those who dream during the day, according to the narrator, are much better off than those who dream during the night, because those who dream during the day are actually making plans. They are the men who have vision, who don't just um, see dreams that cannot be, um, that cannot be put into a concrete form, but these are men who experience visions. In snatches they learn something of the wisdom which is of good and more of the mere knowledge which is of evil. They penetrate however rudderless or compassless into the vast ocean of the light ineffable and like the adventures of the Nubian geographer, Agressi Sant Mare Tenebar Brarum Quid on Io Eset Exploratori, which translated into the English, and I've given you the, the English translation, is they ventured into the sea of darkness in order to explain what it might contain. So you need to venture, you need to have the spirit to explore, and then and then only will you find out what is out there. So he says, we will assume then that I am mad. And so the narrator uh, is assumed to be mad. When we start off with this assumption, then we can forgive the narrator anything because mad people are allowed to do and say whatever they want to. 
there he there are he says two uh, distinct conditions of my mental existence the condition of a lucid reason which is not to be disputed and belonging to the memory of events forming the first epoch of my life the first phase of my life and a condition of shadow and doubt appertaining to the present and to the recollection of what constitutes the second great era of my being so the narrator divides his life into two sections the first is the beginning of his life and the second is when he attains maturity so he divides his life into two uh, sections one where he um, has uh, what he calls the first part of his life and the second is the great era of uh, his existence so what he is going to tell us of the earlier period he says you have to believe that and to what i may relate of the later time give only such credit as may seem due or doubt it altogether or if doubt it ye cannot then play unto its riddle the oedipus okay let's go back a bit so he's dividing his life into two parts the earlier part of his life he puts into the first epoch and the later part of his life he puts into the second epoch when he does that he says that what i tell you of the first part of my life you will not doubt because that is the real truth you may doubt what happened to me or what i experienced in the second half of my life but the first half you have to remember is all true it is all fact so there is no way that you can doubt how i spent the first half of my life so he says there's two things that you can do you can either believe what i'm telling you or you can disbelieve it you can um say that it is a a, a fiction um a, a, a fictional um, story and if you doubt what i'm telling you about the first part of my life then i want you to remember the story of edipus how many of you remember the story of edipus well let me recall it very quickly edipus um was a king who due to some um twisted circumstances ends up by marrying his mother and from that story of king edipus marrying queen jocasta evolves the concept of the the oedipus complex that is um a man who is in love with his mother not having the emotions and sentiments of a child towards its parent but that of a man towards a woman so he says if you doubt what i'm telling you about the first um part of my life i want you to remember the story of oedipus and um when you remember the story or re- when you recall the story of oedipus you will not find it difficult to believe what i am telling you actually happened now this is a story that's rather strange for um readers of the english language for uh perhaps american and british readers but um we pakistanis will not find it anything that is very strange or that is very upsetting about it but let me not give you the spoiler he says she whom i loved in youth and of whom i now pen calmly and distinctly these remembrances was the sole daughter of the only sister of my mother long departed so um the narrator uh falls in love with his first cousin 
Now you'd say, what is so strange about that? We have it happening in our own society all the time. We have a lot of cousin marriages. But you also need to think that for Americans, it is a very strange thing for cousins to marry. And they think that it is going to end up by um, the by, by the genes um, deteriorating, by some strange diseases coming into um, the family because cousins are not supposed to marry cousins. That is why I told you that it's a story that sounds strange when put in another culture, but which is okay uh, if you um, read it or if you hear about it in the Pakistani context. So he says that the person with whom I fell in love in my youth was uh, my first cousin. You'd say uh, my, my khala's uh, daughter. So uh, as I said before, nothing strange about that. Eleonora was the name of my cousin. We had always dwelt together beneath a tropical sun in the valley of the many-colored grass. Now you have to remember this valley of the many-colored grass because it occurs again and again um, in uh, Poe's story, Eleonora. So um, the narrator says, you know, it's a very strange thing, but the, the girl that I loved when I was young was my first cousin. And uh, we lived together for many years in the same place uh, where there were just three people living, the narrator, Eleonora, and Eleonora's uh, mother. And the reason he gives you, if you go back to the previous slide, is that the narrator's mother had died at an early age and therefore his aunt had sort of adopted him and brought him up in, his, in her own uh, home. No unguided footstep ever came upon that veil. So he, they're living in a very secluded place. No unguided footstep, no strangers came into that valley. Those, there were only those people whom they knew about, whom they knew personally and individually, for it lay among a range of giant hills that hung beetling around about it. So this valley is very protected, and that is why it is known as the valley of many colored grass. When the sun touched one section of the valley, it gave the grass a different color, and areas and parts of the valley where the sun never shone, had, uh, had very different colors of uh, grass. So this is a valley that is surrounded by high mountains, and that's one reason why no stranger ever came into that valley. No path was trodden in its vicinity. It's not the kind of place where, for example, tourists would go. And to reach our happy home, there was need of putting back the foliage of many thousands of forest trees and of crushing to death the glories of many millions of fragrant flowers. So um, it was not a house that was, let's say, visible from afar. They had to, um, to get to their house um, passing through a very thick forest. And this is not just a thick forest where you have trees overhead, but there is um, the undergrowth, the grass and the flowers and the wild plants that um, you have to uh, travel in order to get to this house. So it's a very secluded place. It's hidden from um, the, um, the main path and so people do not know that um, there is a house in the forest or that there are three people living there. Thus it was that we lived all alone. That's the three of them. Um, Eleonora, Eleonora's mother and the narrator. Knowing nothing of the world without the valley because they'd never gone outside the valley so they didn't know um, the world outside the valley. Um, they didn't know what was happening 
they don't know what you could see or what you could hear or perceive um, or experience in the world outside. For them, the world was the valley and there was no other world outside it. These three were the people. There were no people outside um, this trio that is living in the hidden house. So um, these three people lived in this house in the forest. From the dim regions beyond the mountains at the upper end of our encircled domain, there crept out a narrow and deep river. So in the forest, in the house in the valley, um, they had a narrow and deep river. So um, the, the top of the river was very narrow and it was also very deep. But, he says, it wasn't as deep, it wasn't as bright as the eyes of my Eleonora. See the love that is reflected in that. My Eleonora. She has the brightest eyes in the whole wide universe. So he's talking about the river and yet he says that the river was not as deep as the eyes of Eleonora. So whatever positive thing he's going to describe, he's going to compare it with Eleonora and Eleonora is way up there while the rest of the objects are somewhere here. So it passed away at length through a shadowy gorge among hills still dimmer than those whence it had issued. And this is the river that is called the river of silence, for there seemed to be a hushing influence in its flow. No murmur arose from its bed, and so gently it wandered along that the pearly pebbles upon which we love to gaze, far down within its bosom, could be seen. So it was, the, the water was very clear. It was um, a very fast flowing river, but it was known as the river of silence because of um, the uh, sort of murmuring uh, sound that you heard in the waves of the river. And it seemed to cast a kind of um, silent mantle or covering over the entire valley. So um, the, the narrator and his cousin Eleonora um, called it the river of silence. It may have had a name um, that was given to it um, by, um, uh, by explorers, by discoverers, but because no people came into this valley, therefore the narrator and Eleonora could call it whatever they wanted to, and they called it the river of silence. Okay? The margin of the river and of the many dazzling rivulets that glided through devious ways into its channels, as well as the spaces that extended from the margins away down into the depths of the streams until they reached the bottom, the bed of pebbles at the bottom. These spots, not less than the whole surface of the valley, from the river to the mountains that girdled it in, were carpeted all by a soft green grass. Thick, short, perfectly even, and vanilla perfumed. But so be sprinkled throughout with the yellow buttercup, the white daisy, the purple violet, and the ruby red asphodel, that its exceeding beauty spoke to our hearts in loud tones of the love and the glory of God. So the beauty of the valley moves the narrator to think about the beauty of God. This beautiful detailed description in Poe's story here. He talks about this beautiful, thick, evenly mown grass. You don't have any lawn mowers there. You don't have lawn mowers. You only have natural grass. And this natural grass is full of different colored flowers, all growing in the wild. Remember, it's not cultivated. 
this is um, grass growing in the wild, flowers growing in the wild, trees growing in the wild, and human beings living in the wild because they're not living in the city, they're not living in a village. They are living in this one house in the valley that he calls is of many colored grass. It's actually the different flowers also that give the grass its color. And here and there in groves about this grass sprang up fantastic trees. So everything is growing in the wild. Um, there's nothing that has been cultivated. Their mark was speckled with the vivid alternate splendor of ebony and silver and was smoother than all save the cheeks of Eleonora. So the grass is soft. It's beautiful. There are gorgeous flowers. And yet, Eleonora is more beautiful. Eleonora's skin is softer than the softest grass, than the softest petal of the flower. So that but for the brilliant green of the huge leaves that spread from the summits in long tremulous lines dallying with the zephyrs, one might have fa fancied them giant serpents of Syria doing homage to their sovereign, the sun. So he makes a comparison with the giant serpents of Syria. And he says that these trees, they looked so beautiful. Um, their trunks, because they did not get much light, their trunks appeared to be dark. The tops appeared to be silvery because they were there in the sunlight. So he says that these trees, they appeared to be like giant snakes because the, the black and the silver was so beautiful. One might have thought that these were giant snakes if one didn't know that they were actually trees. Hand in hand about this valley for 15 years roamed I with Eleonora before love entered within our hearts. So when um, they first became conscious of each other, Eleonora and the, 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 the narrator had lived together for 15 years. And in these 15 years, they had never been away from each other. They had never been apart from each other. So he says that we were 15 before any thought of love entered our hearts or our minds. The first 15 years, we spent like children. We were together. We lived together. There was absolutely um, no other thought. We were good friends. Um, we did not think about ourselves as um, individuals. It was one evening at the close of the third lustrum of her life and of the fourth of my own that we sat locked in each other's embrace beneath the serpent-like trees and looked down within the water of the river of silence at our images therein. Now the idea that he gives here is that the first thought of love came into their minds when Eleonora had just turned 16, because he says the 15th year of her life was coming to a close. So he, she was approaching the 16th year, and the narrator was approaching the 20th year. Um, if you look up lustrum on Google or in a dictionary, lustrum refers to five years. So five threes are 15, five fours are 20. He says the fourth lustrum of my life the third lustrum of Eleonora's life. 
So when the writer or the narrator was 20 and his cousin was uh, 15, they fell in love with each other as they were sitting beside this river of silence uh, where they had sat for countless years and countless times and not felt what they felt at this particular moment. So this is where they fall in love when they're sitting side by side uh, by the river of silence. They look at the image in the water and that is when um, they realize that um, they were made for each other and that they could not live apart from each other. We spoke no words during the rest of that sweet day and our words even upon the morrow were tremulous and few. So when they realize that they love each other, there is a sort of distance that comes between them. There is a sort of formality that comes between them. He says, we sat there in silence, looking at our images, at ref the reflection of our selves in the river of silence. And even on the next day, um, we had hesitation in talking to each other because we could not express what we were going through. We had drawn the god Eros down from that wave and now we felt that he had enkindled within us the fiery souls of our forefathers. Eros, you know, is the Greek god of love. Um, the one that you call Cupid in Roman mythology is Eros in Greek mythology. And he says it's almost as if when we were sitting beside the river, we called love into our hearts and we could not be the same after that. And in doing this, we were only following our ancestors, our forefathers, who had been through this um, same feeling for centuries, for generations. And we found out that we could not help behaving like our ancestors. The passions which had for centuries distinguished our race came thronging with the fancies for which they had been equally noted and together breathed a delirious bliss over the valley of the many-colored grass. So the, the spirit of the ancestors um, coming into the narrator and Eleonora and finding out that they had very strong emotions towards each other um, the, 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 their passion had been aroused. A change fell upon all things. Strange, brilliant flowers, star-shaped, burnt out upon the trees where no flowers had been before. So when um, they fall in love, it's like the whole world changes for them and they start noting things that they had not noted earlier. The tints of the green carpet deepened. So these are things that they imagine are changing in nature. They may not be changing actually, but because um, the, the ancestors, the forefathers of the narrator and his cousin were very strong in imagination, so when they fall in love, they think that the whole world has changed. And that's what lovers throughout um, history have always um, felt. Life arose in our paths. The tall flamingo, hitherto unseen, flaunted his scarlet plumage before us. So uh, creatures came to us and it was almost as if the different creatures wanted us um, to realize the beauty that is to be found in the world outside. Uh, and that includes this, um, the, the, the flamingo birds. It includes the golden and silver fish. Um, it includes um, sweet sounds, sweet music coming from, let's say, the harp of Eolus. Um, sweeter than all, again, save the voice of Eleonora. So everything about Eleonora is the best 
all else must be second best. Nothing in nature can compare with Eleonora. The beauty and um, sparkle in her eyes, the softness of her skin, the sweetness of her voice were right there at the top, the best. And everything else in nature was subsidiary to that. And now too, a voluminous cloud which we had long washed in the regions of Hesper floated out thence all gorgeous in crimson and gold and settled in peace above us, sank day by day lower and lower until its edges rested upon the tops of the mountains, turning all their dimness into magnificence and shutting us up as if forever within a magic prison house of grandeur and of glory. So, when they realize that they have fallen in love, then all of nature seems to bloom. All of nature assumes a glory that it had not had before. And it looks at the beauty of Eleonora from a completely new perspective. The loveliness of Eleonora was that of the seraphim, the angels. She's as beautiful as an angel, but she was a maiden artless and innocent as the brief life she had led among the flowers. Now, th this is rather ironic when he, po when Poe compares her with um, the flowers. The life of a flower is a very short one. It blooms. It has its moment of glory and then it starts to fade away, dry up until it dies. And that happens very fast. So by comparing Eleonora's beauty with that of a flower, what Poe is trying to make us realize is that she died very young. So no guile disguised the fervor of love which animated her heart and she examined with its inmost recesses as we walked together in the valley of the many-colored glass and discoursed of the mighty changes which had lately taken place therein. So when they fall in love, the whole world changes. They talk to each other. They say, oh, you know how beautiful the world is. And it's actually the feeling inside that is reflected in the world outside. And at length, having spoken one day in tears of the last sad change which must befall humanity, she thenceforward dwelt upon this one sorrowful theme, interweaving it into all our converse, as in the songs of the Bard of Shiraz, the same images are found occurring again and again in every impressive variation of phrase. So a reference that Poe makes to um, the Persian uh, poet and how um, in time or rather in a very short time Eleonora started speaking about death death as the means of separating lovers she spoke about it once and then somehow that was all that she spoke about during the time that we spent with each other. She had seen that the finger of death was upon her bosom. So she falls ill. So beautifully does Poe express it. He doesn't say that she falls ill. He just says that she had seen that the finger of death was upon her bosom. That like the ephemeron, she had been made perfect in loveliness only to die. So something that blooms is beautiful uh, in its bloom and fades away very quickly. The terrors of the grave to her lay solely in a consideration which she revealed to me one evening at twilight by the banks of the river of silence. So there are two places that have a very uh, important role to play in this short story. The valley of the many colored grass and the river of silence. Everything that happens, all the so-called action that takes place, 
takes place either in the valley of the many-colored grass or by the river of silence. She grieved to think that having entombed her in the valley of the many-colored grass, I would quit forever its happy decesses, transferring the love which now was so passionately her own to some maiden of the outer and everyday world. So like all women, she is only upset by the thought that when she dies, her lover is going to marry someone else outside the valley of the many colored grass. And the valley of the many colored grass and the river of silence will cease to exist for the narrator because he will be in the outside world. And then and there I threw myself hurriedly at the feet of Eleonora. So the narrator is so consumed by his passion that he falls at the feet of Eleonora and he swears by all that he holds holy that he will never love another woman. That there would be no way that he would um, debase the memory of um, his first and what he considers only love. And I call the mighty ruler of the universe to witness the pious solemnity of my vow. So he says, by all that I hold holy, I am never going to fall in love again. I am never going to touch another woman. And the curse which I invoked of him and of her, a saint in illusion, should I prove traitorous to that promise, involved a penalty, the exceeding great horror of which will not permit me to make a record of it here. So he swears, he makes a vow, and he says, I will never fall in love again, and you are all that matters to me. Um, and um, then he tells us of um, a vow that he makes, but the vow is so frightening in its intensity that he says, I cannot write of it, I cannot write what I promise, but I know that I promise that I would never fall in love with another woman, um, that Eleonora is the only love of my life. And of course, the bright eyes of Eleonora grew brighter at my words. It made her very happy. Um, she was dying anyway, so this was a kind of reassurance for her because um, when, uh, when she realized that she was going to die, the only thought that bothered her was that she would die and the narrator would move on. His life would not end, his life would move on. And so when he swears to her, when he makes this vow that he will never fall in love with another woman, it gives her a sense of reassurance. And it's almost as if a burden has been taken um, away from her. And she said to me not many days afterward, tranquilly dying, that because of what I had done for the comfort of her spirit, she would watch over me in that spirit when departed. And if so, it were permitted her return to me visibly in the watches of the night. But if this thing were indeed beyond the power of the souls in paradise, that she would at least give me frequent indications of her presence, sighing upon me in the evening winds, or filling the air which I breathed with perfume from the censers of the angels. And with these words upon her lips, she yielded up her innocent life, putting an end to the first epoch of my own. So when she's dying, she says, I will watch over you always. And if that is not allowed to me, then you will feel me when the wind blows. You'll feel me around you whenever you need me. And this is how her life comes to an end. And as the narrator says, the first epoch of his life came to an end. Thus far, and this is where Poe switches. And he says, thus far I have faithfully said, but as I passed the barrier in time's path, formed by the death of my beloved, and proceed with the second era of my existence, remember his life does not come to an end. It's Eleonora's life that comes to an end. His life goes on. 
and he feels that a shadow gathers over my brain and I mistrust the perfect sanity of my record. But let me on. Years drag themselves along heavily. See how quickly time passes when he's with Eleonora. And yet time drags when Eleonora dies. And he says, I still dwelled in the, the valley of the many-colored cross. But a second change had come upon all things. The star-shaped flowers shrank into the stems of the trees and appeared no more. So the world changed. The world changed physically for him. The beauty in the valley of the many-colored glass, uh, grass was not just because of the nature. It was also because Eleonora was there. Her presence made everything seem more beautiful than it was. And with Eleonora passing away, the valley of the many-colored grass loses its beauty. The tints of the green carpet faded, the color of the flowers fades, and he says the tall flamingo even flaunted no longer his scarlet plumage before us. So the birds, the trees, the bees, the flowers, they all seem to shrink in size, beauty, and intensity because Eleonora was no more. And the golden and silver fish swam down through the gorge at the lower end of our domain and betaked the sweet river never again. So even the fish disappeared. Um, the world inside reflects the world outside and vice versa. When you're happy, you think the world is happy. And when you are sorrowing, you feel that the whole world is depressed. And that is what the narrative feels when Eleonora goes. And the lulling melody that had been softer than the wind harp. So the whole world changes for him. Nature changes for him. And he cannot see um, beauty in nature the way he could when Eleonora was there. Remember in the first half, he's comparing everything in nature to Eleonora. And Eleonora comes... Um, out the best but with her death the, for the narrator the whole world changes and he says the end was that this voluminous cloud which he had seen and which had covered the, the, the valley, the mountain tops he says that uprose and abandoning the tops of the mountains to the dimness of old fell back into the regions of Hesper. So even that cloud disappeared and never again appeared in the valley of many colored glass. Yet the promise of Eleonora were not forgotten. So he didn't fall in love again. For I heard the sounds of the swinging of the censers of the angels. So he could hear, he could feel around him the presence of Eleonora, especially when he was alone, because indistinct murmurs filled often the night air, and once, but once only, he was awakened from sleep by the pressing of spiritual lips upon my own. So it's, he, he almost feels her physical uh, self, but he says that happened only once. But the void within my heart refused to be filled. I longed for the love which had before filled it to overflowing. So he longed for something. He longed for love. With the death of Eleonora, everything seemed to have changed. At length the valley pained me through its memories of Eleonora, and I left it forever for the vanities and the turbul turbulent triumphs of the world. So he leaves the valley of the many-colored grass and found himself in a strange city where all things might have served to blot from recollection the sweet dreams, the pomps and pageantries of a stately court and the mad clangor of arms, the radiant loveliness of women bewildered and intoxicated my brain. So it was a whole different world. You had the valley of the many colored grass and the river of silence on the one hand, and you have the mad rush of the, the city on the other hand. 
The two cannot be compared. They're two totally different worlds. So the first half of his life, he lives in the midst of nature. The second half of his life is in the city. And the city, with all its madness, with all its um, fast-moving traffic, um, noise, that it sort of um, overpowers the narrator and makes him forget what he had considered um, to be his life up to that point. But even after he enters the city, he says, my soul proved true to its vows and the indications of the presence of Eleonora were still given me in the silent hours of the night. So for the first um, few, um, few, for the first few days or weeks, he continues to feel the presence of Eleonora. But how long can that go on? Soon, he says, there came from some far, far distant and unknown land into the gay court of the king I served, a maiden who, to whose beauty my whole recreant heart yielded at once. So soon, he says, he met another beautiful woman. And the, the beauty of this woman overpowered him. And he, although he did not forget Eleonora, he could still find place for another woman in his heart. What indeed was my passion for the young girl of the valley in comparison with the fervor and the delirium and the spirit-lifting ecstasy of adoration with which I poured out my whole soul in tears at the feet of the ethereal ermine god. So Eleonora on one hand, ermine god on the other. Eleonora symbolizing nature, um, everything that was innocent, that was pure, ermine god, everything that is beautiful, that is earthly, that is materialistic. So from that um, natural existence, from that innocent and pure existence, he moves into city life. He moves into maturity, adulthood. So those 20 years that he had spent, he had spent as an innocent young man. But when he comes into the city, the, the, the fact that Eleonora dies is actually his youthful innocence coming to an end. And when he uh, enters the city, that is his maturity, that is responsibility, that is the materialistic aspect of life, that is real life. Um, what he had with Eleonora was an idyllic existence. But this is the reality. So all those epithets, all those adjectives that he had used for Eleonora, he now transfers to Ermengard and he says that she was beautiful, she was gorgeous and I could think of no one in her presence. But he says the, the wonderful thing is that he never once feels guilty. He has taken that vow but he doesn't feel guilty. And he says, it's only once, again, it's once that it happens that he feels through um, the lattice window that there is a presence and he almost hears a familiar and sweet voice saying, sleep in peace for the spirit of love reigneth and ruleth. And in taking to thy passionate heart her who is Ermengard, thou art absolved for reasons which shall be made known to thee in heaven of thy vows unto Eleonora. So when he falls in love with um, Ermengard, he doesn't feel guilty. He doesn't feel that he's doing something wrong. He doesn't feel that he's betraying Eleonora in any way because he hears her voice 
and the voice seems to say, sleep in peace. For the spirit of love reigneth. You loved me, you love Ermengarde. I am no more, but Ermengarde is living. So if you love her, if you show her all the love and passion that you had reserved for me, I will not hold you responsible for having betrayed me. So this voice that he hears, what is it that, um, that, that he hears in that voice? It's a very reassuring voice. It's a voice that tells him not to fear, to put his trust, to put his faith and love in Ermengarde to give her the same status that he had given to Eleonora because it is in the spirit of love that this is happening. So the spirit of Eleonora does not deny the narrator uh, the ability or the capacity to love another woman. And this is a sort of indication that love is not selfish, that it is all encompassing. And a man who had loved Eleonora at um, one time could love another and would not be held responsible for having betrayed Eleonora because that is the second part of his life. Eleonora does not exist anymore. Um, the narrator's life with her has come to an end. With the life with Ermengarde is be just beginning. So his life is divided into two parts. The first epoch is the youthful innocence. The second is that of maturity, that of adulthood. Before I leave you today, I want, you, I want to go quickly um, through what we have done today. I started off with telling you that um, this is going to be a series of short stories that we're going to be um, doing now, uh, written by Edgar Allan Poe. We're going to be doing stories of um, other writers also, but we've started with Poe because we are starting chronologically. And Poe's story, Eleonora, is about um, the life of uh, a man who is actually the narrator. The narrator doesn't give his own name, but he does give the names of the two women who are involved. And he divides his life into two halves. And at the very outset, he says that I belong to a race that is passionate, emotional, and um, that has uh, an imagination that works. So um, I fell in love with my cousin, um, with whom I had um, lived in the same house for 15 years. And it is at the end of the 15th year that one day when we were sitting beside the river of silence, we found out that we loved each other and we could not live without each other. And in the beginning, it um, caused some sort of um, discomfort for us, but we got used to each other and um, although um, it is not considered right for cousins to, uh, to have a relationship, yet I could not imagine um, any other woman because Eleonora was the most beautiful, her skin was the softest, the most glowing, she had the sweetest voice. Um, everything that is perfection is embodied in Eleonora. And um, the, the point that um, the narrator wants us to focus on is the fact that soon after they discover this emotion, this um, passion, um, Eleonora starts talking about dying. And um, that's when the narrator realizes that she's very ill and that she's close to death. And um, Eleonora is only afraid of dying because she feels that the narrator will go away and marry someone from the city. 
and the narrator um, with his heart full of emotions and passion he falls on his um, knees and says I am never going to fall in love again now that's a vow that he takes Eleonora dies um, the narrator moves on from the valley of the many colored grass because he realizes that um, a lot of the charm of the valley of uh, many colored grass was the presence of Eleonora so the world outside reflected the happiness that he had felt in the presence of Eleonora that love that emotional uh, emotional attachment and happiness that he felt in the presence of Eleonora was what made the world so beautiful um, and with her gone he doesn't find uh, the valley that attractive so he moves on to the city and in the city um, there is a time when he feels the presence of Eleonora but very soon um, he meets another woman he falls in love with her uh, and instead of feeling guilty instead of um, feeling that this is something that should not have happened he um, he considers her to be the most beautiful woman uh, and he doesn't feel guilty because he has moved on his life with Eleonora came to an end with the death of Eleonora but he did not die he lived on and what um, what the narrator and what uh, Poe are trying to tell us here is the fact that um, our lives are divided into two parts the portion or the part that we spend uh, with our families um, and that is the life of innocence when we attain maturity then we cut ourselves away from our families our parents our siblings but life moves on and there are other things that keep us busy that are, there are other things in which we involve ourselves just as the narrator of um, the story title Eleonora moves on from Eleonora to Ermengarde so from innocence to maturity from youth to adulthood um, it's it's a transition that every human being has to make it is not something strange that happens to the narrator it is um, what is experienced by uh, by all human beings we all start our lives um, in the lap of our family and uh, we move on to adulthood where we are independent of our family where those ties with the family are broken so the valley of many colored grass is that family the river of silence and the valley of many colored grass symbolizes the comfort um, the luxury um, and the security that we find in our family but when we move away from our family like the narrator moves away from the valley of many colored grass the world does not come to an end life doesn't come to an end we move on we make our own life independent perhaps of our uh, parents our siblings uh, but life nevertheless and he doesn't feel guilty because he says I heard the voice of Eleonora I heard the voice of my youth my innocence saying that this is how things happen this is a part of the natural cycle of life things move on human beings die human beings are born they grow up they grow old they deteriorate they die this is the life cycle this is the pattern of life and um, Eleonora who symbolizes youth um, innocence does not blame does not blame the narrator for having fallen in love with Ermengarde for having made a life of his own away from the valley of the many colored cross I hope I have been able to explain the story to you you need to maybe read it once or twice 
before everything that I have said and everything that you have in your mind will make all these ideas very clear to you. Thank you for being very patient and Allah Hafiz for now.